It's good to be with you in the Lord's house today. I'm going to be reading from Psalm 122. I was glad when they said to me, Let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. So the admonition is for us to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And in the time of turmoil and war, it would seem that that is almost lost in the chaos of what's happening. But when we read scripture that tells us that God is going to set up his eternal kingdom on earth in Jerusalem, and that there will be peace. We know that that time is coming. There will be things between now and then that will cause us a lot of anxiousness and cause us to be on our face before the Lord. But we are praying for God's peace to come on that wonderful day where he sets things in order. Amen? And then the wonderful thought that he says... I will now say, peace be within you. That is also a challenge, isn't it? There's always things going on around us and sometimes even inside us, physically and spiritually, emotionally, mentally, uh, that wear on us and weigh on us. But it would be good for us to pray, Lord, reign in our hearts and minds, in our bodies, amen, and in our soul with your peace. He is the peace speaker, isn't he? And uh, I, I know that we all enjoy that when we experience it. I like that old song, peace, peace, wonderful peace, coming down from our Father above. Sweep over my spirit. Amen? Wouldn't it be wonderful if the Lord would do that while we're here together today? So join our hearts together as we pray. I, I'd encourage you to pray for uh, Brother Carl Vanderpool and Shirley. Uh, but Carl is in the hospital. His leg and foot is doing well. But he has somehow uh, developed C. diff. Uh, the infection in the blood, and he is in critical condition. And uh, uh, spent quite a while, two different times, talking to Shirley this week, and uh, her heart is overwhelmed, and uh, Carl literally cannot do anything for himself. And uh, he's been in the hospital now a little over a week. Uh, and they have not given a good prognosis. So uh, please keep Carl and uh, Shirley in your prayers. Um, there are a multitude, it seems like, it's not, a, but there are several people that are very ill and would covet your prayers today. Uh, let's pray. Father, we pause for a moment to enter your throne room by the name of your Son, Jesus. We speak the name of Jesus 
in faith and in hope. Confident, Lord, because of what your word declares, if we ask anything believing, in Jesus' name we shall receive it. So, Lord, first of all, we thank you for that, that you have given us the right to use his name and that you have given us encouragement to bring our needs to you. Your word also says, enter your gates with thanksgiving and your courts with praise. Be thankful to you and to bless your name. And we do that from grateful hearts. So thankful, Lord, beyond what our words could adequately express. So thankful for all that you do for us. We are most thankful for who you are. You are our Heavenly Father. You are our dearest friend. You're our confidant. You're our advocate. You are the source of our breath and our life and all things that we enjoy. We praise you today, Lord, as we've come to your house, that, Lord, you are prepared to give to us that which we so greatly need. And we ask you, Lord, that you would pay close attention to Brother Carl and Shirley. Lord, what a couple of years it has been for them. We pray that you would relieve this suffering and that you would bring divine and supernatural help from your throne to them today. Let this be a day of turning, a day of miracle, a day of being able to see your hand moving on their behalf. For the many, Lord, that need encouragement and strength that you would come alongside them and that your presence would so satisfy and encourage their hearts. Be with us here in the sanctuary as we worship, as we take time in your word, and let it be the nourishment, wisdom, and strength that we need. We ask it in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Amen. God rest to bless you. So good to see you. Good to have Wayne back. And uh, turn to your neighbor and smile at him. If you're a little distant, you can just wave and say, how you doing? <laughs> it's good to have you here today. Let's worship the Lord. songs in so we're singing from the book and from our brain this morning all right <laughs>
book to page 3, 4, 3. Jesus is someone who sees everything about you and knows you better than you know yourself. He understands what's going on, why things are not going on, and we can trust him. to about 99.5% of you. <laughs> but it's good, isn't it? It's a good song. All right, page 461. He is so precious to me.
Singing 
Is there anyone here this morning that would like to give a testimony of praise? Something you're thankful to the Lord for? Malia? Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for what you've done and what you're still going to do. Praise God. Anyone else have a word of praise that you'd like to share today? Yes. Yes, Jerry. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. <clears throat> I meant to mention Paul had just briefly said to pray for Glenda. I don't know the details, but keep her in prayer uh, as you are mindful of her this week. Anyone else? All right, thank you, Don, for your help this morning. First John, chapter one, verse eight. First John, chapter one, verse eight. Just the first part of the verse says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 1 John 1 8. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. 
and the truth is not in us. So the question would be, since this is a biblical verse, what is our sin? Now, I'm not asking you to confess that to me. Some of us may not even be aware or be able to give a name to our sin. But how many understand that our flesh is sin? The Bible says that our flesh is carnal. And even though our soul can be redeemed, purchased through the blood of Jesus Christ, and we can be born again spiritually, how many realize that we still have this flesh issue? One of the professors I had in Bible college said almost every time we came to class, he said, how many of you threw a fresh shovel of dirt on the grave of your old man? He said, I'm not talking about your dad, I'm talking about your flesh. Because if you don't keep throwing dirt on his grave, he's going to get up and cause you trouble. It's quite a thought. Paul said we wrestle in our spirit against the carnal flesh. Then let's turn to Luke 18, verse 9 through 14. Gospel of Luke 18, verse 9 through 14. Now, it's, 1 John 1, 8 said, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So my question was, what is your sin? That's for you to answer. And then the next question I would submit to you, are you sorry? We're going to answer that through some scriptural thought here in a moment, but let's look at 18 of Luke 9 through 14. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everybody else, Jesus told this parable, verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast, verse 12, I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. So going back to verse 9, it's talking about some who are confident in their own righteousness and it causes them to look down from their pedestal of self-righteousness upon those that are not as righteous as they. Verse 13, but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me a sinner. Verse 14, Jesus talking, I tell you that this man rather than the other, the tax collector rather than the one who claimed to be righteous, the Pharisee, I tell you that this man rather than the other went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted. I, I think there's probably no one here today that comes close to comparing to myself in the area of having said and needing to say, I'm sorry. Seems like I... I've done that a lot. I remember when President Trump was uh, running for president. Uh, he made the statement uh, on camera, 
I, I, I have never said I'm sorry, and I never will. And that kind of shocked me. I thought, oh, my goodness, I, I have had to say that a lot in my life. Uh, it reminds me of the story that my dad used to tell about his dad, his granddad, that had a sorry mule. And he just got married, and three times on the way home, the mule balked and kind of shook the, the little carriage that they were in going home from their wedding. And when he got to the gate, the mule balked again, and Granddad uh, pulled out the old rifle and shot the mule. And he turned to his wife and he said, that was the third time. And then they got into it at different times and along the marriage, and he would say, that's, that's the first time. I don't know that that's true, but my dad used to tell it as though it was. How many have ever had to say you're sorry? But there's a difference between having to say it to pacify someone who's upset at you and saying it because in your heart you have godly sorrow. You see that what was done was wrong, and you say it with repentance. To be sorry means to be filled with sorrow. Sorrow that is greater than protecting yourself or defending yourself or excusing yourself. That's godly sorrow. What can the Pharisee and the tax collector in this story in Luke 18 teach us? Well, let me tell you this. A little woman told a conversation that she'd had with her four-year-old son, and they'd gotten out of their Bible studies one night, and uh, they were walking to the car to go home. And her son, walking beside her, said, Mom, I'm going to sin Never again. And she got to wondering about this, so she asked him why he had said that. And this was his answer. Jesus said, if you don't sin, you can throw the first stone. I want to throw the first stone. Now, a four-year-old, he didn't really comprehend what he was thinking about. When I was young, I threw a lot of stones and I did get in trouble because there were times I threw stones I shouldn't have thrown, uh, thrown at. Sorry. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation. So if there's a wrong or a sin or a failure that brings you short of what God would have you to be and do, there needs to be a godly acknowledgement that you're wrong and a godly intention toward God that you don't want to do that, that you do want to honor and please the Lord with your life and actions with your words and your responses. And here in 2 Corinthians 7.10 it says, Godly sorrow worketh repentance. So if you're genuinely sorry because you know that it's something that is displeasing and grieves the heart of God, it will cause you to repent. It works in you. If you love God, at some point, if you've done something wrong, you're going to repent. And the repentance, having repented and continuing to repent, brings you to salvation. Amen? Uh, sorry has been used in cultures all over the world, in America here. It used to be in our culture that if 
an individual, actor, politician, public figure, any, anyone, did something that they shouldn't have done or said, if they just stood in front of a camera or went to the people they had offended and admitted that they were wrong, most people would just forgive them. How many remember those days? How many know that that's changed? In the last few years, we've entered an era where people want to be like the little four-year-old. They want to be the first one to throw stones. It's called cancel culture. We hear about it almost every day in the news. It dominates social media, dominates the internet, and it dominates the thinking of people here in America and around the world. Uh, if something happened even 30, 40, 50 years ago and they found out about it today, they're not going to not only forgive you, they won't forgive you, but they are going to treat you as though you have continued to do it and you're the same person even if you have repented and changed. No matter how many times in our world you say, I'm sorry, the people of our society and of the modern world never forget and they never bring themselves to a place of forgiveness. How many see that happening in our society? So let me just bring this to focus. God says, if you can't learn to forgive, then when you stand before my Father, I will not forgive you. Which says there's sin. If God is not going to forgive because we have withheld our forgiveness, we have sinned. That's just one possibility. Uh, no matter how many times we say we're sorry, if it's not godly sorrow, what happens? We continue to do it. Which really is saying we really weren't sorry. I remember hearing different people say, well, the only sorrow you got is you're sorry you got caught. You've heard that, haven't you? But godly sorrow worketh repentance and brings us to a place of transformation, salvation, born again. We're no longer that person. We don't longer do those things. Amen. An agnostic by the name of Andrew Sullivan observed that the modern council culture filled the void that Christi Christianity once owned. Think about that. This is an agnostic, and he's saying that the modern culture, the council culture of today, has filled the void Christianity once owned, only without any of the wisdom and culture and restraint that Christianity provided. That's quite a thought. If anyone in the world ought to be able to show forgiveness, grace, and mercy, it ought to be the people of God. But because we have become stone throwers, now, we may not go out in the parking lot or the, we've got a lot of stones out here. Kids will constantly throw them out in the parking lot, throwing them against cars and stuff. We may not literally do that, but our eyes, our facial expressions, the tone of our voice, and the way we treat people is throwing stones. Another man, the online, he noted that the online shame culture of modern times is Christianity with all of the forgiveness sucked out. That's quite a statement against the church. People who believe in God, believe in God's word. 
that we have become analytical of others and judgmental of others to the point that we show little grace or forgiveness. You know what happens then? People become belligerent and angry and frustrated and they don't feel any reason to repent because there's no true picture of salvation. Do people see Jesus in us? Do they hear Jesus when they hear us? Do they feel Jesus? Such as when the woman was taken from the bed of adultery and drugged before Jesus in face of the religious leaders, Jesus said, this is what he said, Neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. The religious people of the Lord's day were there to have her stoned to death. And yet Jesus not only totally dismissed the need for stoning, he said, I will not condemn you. Go on about your life and stop your sinning. Because if you are truly godly sorrowful, you'll change what you're doing. Our text today, we read about a man that was like that. He would have felt totally at home in our present cancel culture in the world today. This man was a Pharisee, a religious man, and he was a stone thrower. I thank God that I'm not like that man who was the tax collector. Listen to the words of Jesus. Do you remember what he said? I tell you that this man who the Pharisees said, I'm so glad I'm not like him. I tell you that this man who's a tax collector, who beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, that he will go home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and who humbles himself will be exalted. It's not a message that most Christians want to hear. But sadly, it is a message that we all need to hear. For there is a great failure in the testimony of Christ, grace, mercy, forgiveness. Amen? Being able to love one another. Amen? When you find a brother or sister in fault, go to them in a spirit of, what did the Bible say? Love, mercy, grace, and forgiveness, and restore them. Jesus told the parable about these two men that went up to the temple. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men. And he listed sins that to him were grievous. He said, on top of that, I'm a faster. I'm a person that separates myself from things that would benefit me during the week, twice a week. And I give tithes of all that I get. When we look at the Pharisee and what he did, first he declared how righteous he was, which the Bible says is self-righteousness. I'm not like everyone else. And he gives God a list of the things that he doesn't do. But how many know the New Testament, the Old Testament is full of laws and judgments and principles and all these things the Bible says we're going to give an answer for. Even the idle thoughts. Can you imagine? Notice what this Pharisee did. He declared how righteous he was, lists the sins that he didn't particularly do, and then identifies that he's a faster and a tither. 
Now, tithing is good. It's a good idea. It's a good principle. Why? Because God says if you don't tithe, you're stealing from him. That tithe belongs to God. That's not pastor's opinion. It's not the assemblies of God's opinion. It's God's opinion. Proverbs 3, 9, 10, Honor the Lord with all your wealth and with the first fruits of your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty. Your vats will be bursting with wine. Malachi 3, 10, Bring the full tithe, the full tithe, into the storehouse that there may be food in my house, that thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down upon you blessings until there is no more need. That's God's word on the subject. So yes, tithe, it belongs to God. And if you give it to him because it's his with a good heart, then you get blessed. Fasting's a good thing. Isaiah 58, 8 and 9 tells us, If we do our fasting correctly, then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily, and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call, uh, and the Lord will answer. You shall cry, and he will say, Here I am. How many want the Lord to say that for you? I'm here for you. So yes, fasting is a good thing. But when you look at Isaiah 58, 10, it explains why fasting is beneficial. He says, if you pour yourself out for the hungry and satisfy the desire of the afflicted, then shall you light your light rise in the darkness and your gloom be as the noonday. So, one, one writer says the perspective of fasting is taking away from yourself and giving what you would have given to yourself to those that are in need. That's what Isaiah 58.10 is teaching. It's not just saying I'm going to leave that on the shelf and I'll eat it tomorrow, but today I'm going to fast. No, it says take what you are blessed with that you desire and would need and give that away. That's a fast. So it's not only you, it's benefiting someone who did not have. That's an inter interesting perspective, isn't it? But there's another part of the passage, 58, 9, just before verse 10, that the Pharisee overlooked. Yes, God loved fasting and said, done the right way, fasting would speed your healing and please God. But then God puts a condition. He says, if you take away the yoke from your midst, the pointing of the finger and the speaking of wickedness. That's verse 9, just before Isaiah 58.10 that says how you'll benefit if you fast. So God's saying, if we're really going to fast and get God's attention, the first thing that we need to do is take away the yoke from your midst and the pointing of the finger, the cancel culture type of thinking and the speaking of wickedness. The pointing of the finger. How many have heard that when you point, usually you've got your thumb and your forefinger going toward who you're pointing or what you're pointing at and at the same time you've got three fingers coming back at you. It's a biblical principle because God says as we mete out judgment, it shall be meted unto us. Important thoughts, wouldn't you think, in the day that we're living in? I, uh, well, tax, uh, the Pharisee was saying, you're lucky that I'm here and, and there's somebody as good as I am that's here to pray. The tax collector says, I am a miserable wretch. And he beat his chest before God and said, I am a sinner. Be merciful to me. Tax collector, standing afar off, would not lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, 
be merciful to me, a sinner. It occurred to me that Jesus is commending this tax collector for his humility. He's not worthy. He acknowledges that. He doesn't pretend to be worthy. Jesus was impressed by this man's need for God's attention, knowing that he was not worthy of it. He didn't come and said, how dare you, God, not answer my prayer? And what's the matter? I'm, I'm one of your special people. And so often I hear through the years, why didn't God answer my prayer? Why is this happening to me? The Bible says that bad happens to the righteous as well as to the unrighteous equally. It's a part of being human in a carnal world. But we have God. The Bible says we were all born in sin, shapen in iniquity, and until we receive our glorified body, we will have a sin problem. The Lord in the Old Testament said, Be careful as the people of God that you look in a mirror and acknowledge who you are and what good you've done and how much you believe and how you do your vows and your obedience to God. Be careful that when you're doing that and looking at yourself that you don't forget who you are and who God is. That's so important. We are sinners saved by grace. When we confess our sins, the Bible says, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But how long does it take to wash your hands that you no longer have to wash them again? How many carry wet wipes with you? in your vehicle, in your purse. <laughs> you guys don't have purse, but I've got wet wipes in my vehicle, in my truck, and I've got them in my nightstand at home. I've got them in my wife's car. She's got them in her purse. And when I don't have them, I'm always saying, could I have a wet wipe? It's either something on my tie, something on my shirt, something on my hands. I'm saying, ah, I need something to disinfect. Sometimes we forget that we are flesh, filled with His Spirit, but our body struggles with allowing God's Spirit to have free reign. Sometimes it's what we're thinking, sometimes how we're feeling, sometimes it's something that someone said or did or the way they reacted to something that we said or did, and all of a sudden that which is born of God and born of the Spirit is now being channeled by the carnal flesh and thought. How many have that battle? Oh my goodness. It is a constant battle. If we look at the book of Ephesians, Paul is writing to the church uh, of Gentiles. Uh, Gentile is anybody that is not a Jew. They're not circumcised. This Gentile church in Ephesus had been approached by circumcisers. <laughs> I'm giggling, but that's not a funny thought. If you're not circumcised and you've got people coming into the house of God saying, before you can even speak the name of God, ask forgiveness or mercy, or pretend that you are a child of God, you need to go get yourself circumcised. How many remember the story in the Old Testament where God spoke to the leader and told him, I want you to take every male in the nation because they have not been raised, taught, and circumcised by my law as they should have been, and I want you to take them out and do a fast, have them wash themselves in their garments, and come to the tent, and I want every one of them circumcised. That was not a happy day in Israel. In fact, it wasn't happy for several days. 
But what is the church doing? I'm talking about religious people. What does the church do? And someone did this again to our church and to me this week. They called me and asked for an appointment, and I met them. And they were challenging me on our doctrine. And how can you say you are born of God and teach and preach these things? Now, the difference was is that their doctrine does not support our doctrine. And because they feel like they are better than we are, how many know that there are Pentecostal doctrines that say we, because we believe in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we are full of the devil. Because they believe that there is only one person and he is God, Jesus, and the Spirit. And they were, wanted to take me to test. I said, I don't want to offend you and I'm not going to argue with you. I'm not here to convince you. I'm here to save the lost. And you're wasting my time and God time by trying to condemn me. So if you want to talk about witnessing to someone that's lost, that's fine. We're not going to sit here and argue doctrine. That's not what God called his people to do. He called us to shine the light of truth and love. How many would say amen to that? We need to be very careful in a world that is canceling everything that it does not like. that we put ourselves in jeopardy of being canceled by our conduct and our conversation because we're not even following Scripture. Paul writes Ephesians 2, 1 through 5, But you were dead in trespasses and sin in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, for by grace are you saved. Mike, I didn't know you were going to testify today. I didn't know what you were going to testify about. But it hit a chord of this message. When I think about what God did for mankind, and that he even did it for me, for you. And that he being sinless, totally God, sent his son to die on the cross for me. I will never get over the fact, that, number one, I don't deserve it. I don't deserve it today. Nor will I get over the fact that he being holy and pure with no guile and no sin could choose to walk with me. And there's been times I've said in my own voice, God, you don't want to be around me today. I'm not thinking, feeling, or acting good. And the Holy Spirit says, that's the most important time for me to be around you. Because if you don't change that, you're lost forever.
How many know the song Amazing Grace? John Newton wrote Amazing Grace. Once said it like this, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world. But still, I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. Listen to that again. This is a man who's a slave trader. Came to the knowledge of God and experience of forgiveness, grace, and mercy in his life. He writes Amazing Grace, and he said this, I am not what I ought to be. He's received God, received Jesus, repented of what he's done in his life. He said, I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I want to be. I am not what I hope to be in another world, but I am not what I once used to be. And by the grace of God, I am what I am. How many could say that today? I'm so glad I'm not what I was last year. I continue to grow in grace. And some of the greatest days of growth are days that I am humiliated. That I ought to have thought, acted, said, done better than what I allowed myself to do. But thank you, Lord, for your forgiveness, your mercy, and your grace. I want to be better than I am. So as we close today, and Don sing this chorus, for it reaches to the highest mountain. The song Amazing Grace probably is the most well-known Christian song in the world. And it's so important to people who know the message of it. It's often the importance of it is to people who don't like themselves, but they love the fact and are thankful for the fact that God loves them. Let me say it again. They don't like themselves sometimes, but they're so glad that God loves them. Back in 2011, Barna did a survey of Americans and found that one-third of those surveyed and interviewed reported that they struggle mightily with unresolved emotional conflict in their life. Now, that was 2011. I, because of the way I, the things that I deal with on a daily basis, I, I almost believe that it's a, a greater majority of people are struggling with mental, emotional, and spiritual conflict in their lives. It's not a third. I, I think that it's exponentially greater than that. How many think that the world is struggling with mental, emotional, and spiritual crisis? And these are thoughts, and I've heard this even this past week. God would never forgive somebody like me. I'm worthless. I'm always going to be worthless. I'll never be any better than I am. I'll never be able to overcome the mess that I've made. No one will ever forgive me. My question was, I just want to ask you, are you sorry? Are you sorry enough to acknowledge that you need God and that God is the one that can change 
not only things, but he can change you. I feel so stupid and weak and no good. How could God love me? And how could I ever expect anyone else to forgive me when I can't forgive myself? I've heard that thousands of times through the years. I can't forgive myself. How many would say that's probably the most terrible way to have to live? To feel like there's no hope and there's nothing that can be done to help you. That's the way the tax collector felt. He couldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven. He kept bowed because he was ashamed. Ashamed so much that he just beat himself in the chest. I am worthless. I am a sinner. Years ago, there was a gathering of religions held in Chicago. Practically every known religion was represented there. There were many impressive messages by very astute religious leaders. During one of the sessions, a preacher named Joseph Cook stood up and said, Gentlemen, I beg to introduce to you a woman with great sorrow. Blood stains are on her hands and nothing will remove them. The blood is that of a murderer and nothing will take away the stain. She's been driven to desperation in her distress. Is there anything in any of your religions that will remove her sin and give her peace? A quiet hush fell over that large coliseum. There was not even a whisper heard. No one spoke up. Then raising his eyes to heaven, Joseph Cook cried out, I will ask another the same question. John, can you tell me how this woman can get rid of her awful sin? And he waited as if listening for a reply and suddenly cried, Listen, John is speaking. John, 1 John, chapter 1, verse 7. The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sin. That's the answer for you and me. It isn't denying it. It isn't covering it. It isn't pretending that we don't have it. It's acknowledging that it's real and that the blood of Jesus Christ that reaches to the highest mountain and flows to the lowest valley, it's that blood that can give us strength, life, hope, forgiveness. A better tomorrow. How many have yesterdays you wished never happened? I wish I could say they are few. I've often been asked if you could go back and start over and know what you know today, would you? There's times I thought I would. But the closer I get to the end, the more confident I am that it would be no different because I look at the history of mankind and God has showed to every generation and his people thousands and thousands and thousands of untold miracles, signs and wonders, and yet they still fall back into the degradation of carnal nature. 
No, I'm so glad I know the grace of God. I'm so glad for his mercy. I'm gl so glad for his forgiveness. I'm so glad to know that his spirit lives within me and that though I am still a nature of sin, I am by soul and spirit a child of the living God because of the blood of Jesus. So I want you to focus today not on the struggle of the Pharisee and the tax collector, which is going on manifold times every day in the world, but focus on John, 1 John, chapter 1, verse 7 and 8. It's the answer to our struggle. Amen. Would you sing with me? For it reaches to the highest mountain. a glorified body that can no longer be tested or tempted or failed. 
But we don't want to be imagining that we're safe and we have no reason to pray. We have no reason to study. We have no reason to read God's Word. There's more reason now than ever because He's coming. And He's coming for those that are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and have confessed Him as Lord and Savior and have experienced godly sorrow that produces repentance that keeps saving us. There's not a day goes by I don't ask God for forgiveness because there's so much going on and it happens so fast I can't even keep track of what I've said and what I've done. But I don't want anything piling up on my record that says, son, you never brought this to me. You ignored it. You just accepted that everything was okay. Scripture says, work it out. Work out your salvation with fear and repentance. Keep working. Don't sit down. Rise up in the name of Jesus and call upon Him and ask Him to wash you in the blood of His Son. Amen. These altars are open if you'd like to pray. If not, we're going to sing this chorus a couple more times, and I thank you for your faithfulness. I encourage you to walk humbly before God. Do your best to please Him. Amen. Don't listen to the devil. He's a tantrum, cultural stone thrower. And there's a lot of other stone throwers. But God's a forgiver. He's a lover. He's a God of grace and mercy. How many can say, thank you, Lord? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Would you just do that with me before we sing it again? Oh, Father, thank you for forgiveness. Thank you for mercy. Thank you for grace. Thank you, Lord, that you have forgiven and cleansed me and continue to do so. Thank you, Lord, that you look beyond my faults so often and extend your arm and your hand to welcome me into your presence. Oh, Lord, let your people feel your love, experience your mercy, and walk in your favor and blessing. Wash them in the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, and help them to feel saved and full of your love, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. For it reaches to the high, highest mountain, and it flows to the lowest valley. It's the blood that gives the strength from him. <coughs> you have a wonderful rest of your day thank you for your faithfulness